Good morning. Good morning. It's this a- is Russ and Kitty Walden cool. with Father Sark Ministry. It's a beautiful morning in Green Valley, Arizona. It's a beautiful day in the Ozarks. I mean, in <laughs> the desert. Valley. In the desert. The <laughs> desert is blooming like a rose. My sister Karen has several rose bushes, all sorts of colors, and they're all blooming out back. It's a delight to see what can happen in a desert place. <laughs> or if we were in Louisiana, we could say it's a beautiful day on the bayou. Yeah, there's Cynthia. <laughs> That's and for Paula. Cynthia Maddox. I'm sorry, Cynthia Brown. I saw Paula, Paula Maddox. Maddox come into the chat room. Dickie Lee. Now you could go uh, on all morning. Honey. That's a beautiful day <clears throat> out on the, the, what do they call that, Dickie Lee? The Outer Banks, the Chesapeake area. But anyway, anyway. It's a beautiful day where Jesus is with us. Happy, happy, happy mm-hmm. to be here and to study the Bible with you today, as we mentioned Yesterday, we've traveled to from Branson, where our headquarters is, where our home is, to Green Valley, Arizona, uh, arranging for a second home, a modest second home uh, for the purposes of uh, facilitating uh, West Coast ministry, which we uh, do continually, and this is going to make it possible not to have so much time in hotels and not as much on airfare and other things. So we're just really excited about it. And we're also excited that we're transitioning now out of the book of Isaiah (laughs) and into the book of Jeremiah. It's interesting of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied before the captivity. Ezekiel prophesied in the captivity. Uh, We're talking about where the southern kingdom uh, was idolatrous. The southern kingdom was hypocritical in its worship, and they were looking to uh, Egypt and Ethiopia to save them and from the Assyrians, from the Babylonians, and they refused to listen to Isaiah. They refused to listen to Jeremiah, and then God sent them Ezekiel. God keeps talking, and Jeremiah, what? Uh, You know, you you learn things when you study the Bible, when you break down the exegesis, you study the original grammatical uh, structure of the scripture. And we're going, one of the more significant things we're going to find out about Jeremiah is that he was not a bullfrog. (laughs) That song, I heard it first thing this morning when I saw our chapter Jeremiah was not a bullfrog. He was a fine prophet, important prophet. So Jeremiah chapter 1, the call of Jeremiah. In chapter 1 of Jeremiah, as you can see, we are we are well over uh, the little time of flu and difficulty. You say, well, that was a long time ago, but it hung on. Yeah, and, it's uh, so nice to feel good. Praise God. We've been up just walking and, and enjoying the outdoors. And, yes. And just thankful. You get real thankful when you're feeling good and you've gone through some feeling otherwise. (laughs) I know there have been times I've had pain in my body. And and when that was passed, I was was like, thank God. I appreciate it. How many of you appreciate not having pain in your body? uh, If you've got pain in your body, you remember what that was like. And that's why he said that uh, he came that we could be healed. We just pray you receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, But uh, Jeremiah's call, in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we see the father calling him as a very young man to stand before kings and potentates. Jeremiah's message was not one the people were ready to receive, much like Isaiah. Here we are four kings later, a hundred years later after the time of Isaiah. And here, Jeremiah is coming along with with a very similar message. Uh, But God promises Jeremiah that he'll be with him. How would you, you know, would you like to go? It's like I I told you the story how when God sent me to a little church and I knew it was going to be a problem and I'd been in leadership in that church before and the Lord told me, I just want you to go sit in the congregation. But I knew enough about... uh, some problems in the leadership that that wouldn't be that easy. And I got there and I was actually assaulted physically in front of the entire congregation just for walking into the place. And and it was like when God was leading me up to going there, he kept telling me every week, I want you to go. I want you to go. I, I negotiated with him like uh, 
I believe it was Ezekiel. God told him to eat uh, human, uh, to cook his food on human dung mm-hmm. and all this. He said, hey, I've never done that. He says, okay, use use uh, cow dung. Well, it was kind of like that. I was negotiating. I said, do I have to go on Sunday morning? Is it okay if I go Wednesday night? He said, okay, you can go Wednesday night. I, and I didn't want to go. And after a couple of weeks, he said, okay, you're going to go tonight, right? He said, <laughs> If if you don't go tonight, the Lord told me, we're going to have a problem. We don't have a problem, do we? I just hate it when he talks to me like that. It's like, no, we don't have a problem. I'm going. It's like Kitty. Kids for God and Kitty are a lot alike. She'll say, now, she'll tell me something, and then the third time she'll tell me what God's telling her, she'll say, I'm only going to say this one more time. And it's like, oh. I it's hate wisdom. it when that happens. It's wisdom, ladies. It's wisdom. <laughs> but it was that way with Jeremiah. You'll see God talks to Jeremiah and encourages him. You know, he's being told to go do and say some things that he knows won't necessarily turn out well. But God promises to be with him because he's called, just as you are called. And as you study the calling in the beginning of Jeremiah's life, you're going to find a lot of encouragement for the things that God has told you to do and called you to do. It's 19 verses, Jeremiah chapter 1. If you begin with Jeremiah 1, verses 1 through 10, please. All right. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Ananah, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, remember he was the young king, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son um, of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is Jeremiah talking, um, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. So in today's study, we're introduced to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah served under the last four kings of the line of David, of course, before Jesus. Jeremiah lived to see the destruction of the temple and the sacking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. He was the eyewitness to many of the judgments Isaiah spoke over the city in the southern kingdom. He was most well known as the weeping prophet. I would say after the book of Job, Jeremiah is probably one that's given me more applause than others leading up to it in Lamentations, of course, written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah's name was a very common one at the time. It means Jehovah throws down. It's almost like WWE, you know. Mm-hmm. Get ready to rumble. Je- Jehovah throws down. And of course, what it, what it refers to is the throwing down of the southern kingdom because it was idolatrous. God allowing them to go into Babylonian captivity. Uh, it was a name appropriate to his calling and the assignments given to him by the father during his lifetime. He was born into a priestly family, and he lived in Anathoth, just over two miles from the city of Jerusalem. And I thought about that. I thought about his prophesying and how many times he'd go home to Anathoth, two and a half miles outside the city limits, and he'd hear from God. And the next day, he's walking two and a half miles back to the city, rehearsing in his mind what the Lord told him the night before. And uh, Anathoth is located in the land apportioned to the tribe of Benjamin and was one of the 12 cities given to the Levites by the word of the Lord. His ministry, see, when you go to the city of refuge, you've got to remember, you run into guys like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, (laughs) Isaiah. (laughs) His ministry spanned 
40 years until the fall of Judah, after which Jeremiah accompanies against his will a group of Judeans who rebelled against Babylon and went down into Egypt. Their traditions tell us that Jeremiah was stoned, albeit minor traditions suggest that he was sawn asunder, just like Isaiah. Now, the background history of Jeremiah's time is this is the closure, this is the conclusion of the Old Testament time. Uh, it was the, during this time, Jeremiah's lifetime was the final conquest of the Babylonians. Uh, just as Assyria, if you think back when we studied Isaiah, as Assyria was the backdrop of Isaiah's prophesying to, Ju to Judah, uh, so in Jeremiah's day, the great nemesis is Babylon and ultimately the puppet king that they install after Zedekiah by the name of Gedaliah. In Jeremiah's day, the northern kingdom and their ten tribes, they're long gone. And Jerusalem stands alone to face the full fury of Babylon, just as Isaiah had prophesied long before. And that should give you pause. It should teach you something when you think about, well, what about the 12,000 from every of the 12 tribes and all the tribes mentioned in the book of Revelation? Well, whatever that means, it has a spiritual meaning because these 10 tribes bred themselves out of existence in captivity. They went into captivity to Assyria, and they vanished from history. And, of course, people say, well, God knows who they are. Well, wait a minute. When you're talking about the natural tribes, natural Israel, you're talking about under the law. And under the law, if you married outside your tribe, you lost your inheritance, let alone. You were not considered a Jew if you married outside your tribe, and not, not to mention if you married outside of, of uh, if you married into a Gentile bloodline. And so from God's perspective under the law, and when you're, well, yes, but we're under great. No, when you're talking about things dealing with natural Israel, the law applies. And so the, whatever those tribes are that are talked about in the book of Revelation, it means something other. That when I studied that, and I came to an understanding, and God spoke to me, he says, there's tribes in God. You belong to a tribe. You walk in the midst of a, of a, a, a group, uh, into a church you've never been to before, and all of a sudden you're home and you start crying. And uh, you don't know why, because you found your tribe. And so uh, without spending too much time on, on that, uh, as the people ignored Isaiah's message and continued to live lives steeped in idolatry, so it was in Jeremiah's day, the people worshipped their strange gods. They polluted the altars of Jehovah right up to the hour that the Babylonians were at the gate. And the city of Jerusalem faced her awful doom just as Isaiah had declared. Now, the message of Jeremiah, just an overview, is this. Number one, the Babylonians that they were trying to convince themselves they'd be victorious over. He says, no, the, the Babylonians are going to be victorious over the southern kingdom, and they're going to destroy both it and Jerusalem and the temple. Number two, Jeremiah's message was, if Judah will repent, God will save her as a nation from impending invasion, which they didn't do, so the nation did fall. Now, one thing you have to bear in mind, you know that if that, that Jonah would have flunked out of about nine out of ten prophetic schools that are around today because he prophesied something that didn't come to pass. People say, oh, if it didn't come to pass, well, there's a false prophet. You know, we're not going to question ourselves. We're just going to question the prophetic word. Mm -hmm. But Jonah prophesied that Nineveh would be destroyed. And he was, and he was invested in that prophecy because he had seen the day when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, that for a hundred miles, north, south, east, and west, the roads were lined with the crucified bodies of the Jewish aristocracy. And so Jonah hated the Ninevites, and he prophesied to them that they repented. Say, so well, if a, you get a prophetic word, it doesn't come to pass. It's like somebody said one time, do you judge the prophecy by the rebellious spirit of the people or the rebellious spirit of the people by the prophecy? And uh, likewise, 
Jeremiah is almost could be accused of prophesying out of both sides of his mouth. This this nation's going to fall, but it's like he's hedging his bets. But if you repent, it won't happen. Now stop and think about that. Sound like a Jonah. Event. Just just a minute. <laughs> and uh, later on, when the nation was facing captivity, Jeremiah declares that they were required to humble themselves to their conquerors if she hopes to be spared. In other words, he says, hey, it's too late now. It's like whenever Moses was taking the children of Israel into uh, the promised land and they said, oh, we can't go. We're going to be destroyed. And then when they realized they missed it, okay, we'll go. And Moses said, too late. Mm -hmm. There is a such thing as too late in God. Sure. So it's too late. You don't put yourself in a position. And this is what they were doing in Jeremiah's day. Oh, we'll obey now, Jeremiah. We'll believe. Oh, no, too late. God says, no, you go into captivity and humble yourself to the situation. I'll bring you out in due time. Uh, he says, Judah will be destroyed. But it's later going to be restored, not only restored by God's hand, but restored to world dominance, which is fulfilled in Christ. Amen. Babylon will ultimately and finally be destroyed and removed from the earth. Not only natural Babylon, but centuries after Babylon is no longer even thought of. The John the Revelator talks about Babylon in your day and in my day. When he says, come out of her. If you're going to come out of her, then you must be in her. And he says, rejoice over her, you apostles and you holy apostles and prophets, in the end time. So you've got to ask yourself, what are you in? Well, one thing you're in is Christian culture. Are you saying Christian culture is Babylon? Well, the picture of Babylon in the book of Revelation is a woman with a cup of the blood of the martyrs sitting astride a beast with many names. That is a perfect picture, and it's an antithesis to Revelation 12 that talks about the sun-clothed woman, the true church. In the vision of Babylon, it's a picture of Christian culture. We have a woman, the medieval church, with the cup of the blood of the martyrs, which more saints were martyred uh, by the church of the Middle Ages than by at any other time. And she says, that's right, Rome is Babylon, come out of Babylon. Wait a minute. <laughs> She's sitting on a beast with many names. And if you read that in the Latin, it would be a beast with many denomies, i.e. denominations. That's right, come out of them denominations. But I found out that you can take the Christian out of the denomination, but it's really tough to get the denomination out of the Christian. We're talking about contaminated Christian culture that would actually survive if God were to die. They'd just beat the tambourine a little louder and take up an extra offering and have a few more penny marches throughout the week. And so you stop and think about the come out of her. It's kind of like there came a, a time that in the first century that the word of the Lord about the Jewish religious system and the prevailing religious system that crucified Jesus, the church was born in her, and then there came a time that God was saying, come out of her. And out of the prevailing religious system came the emerging, pur uh, emerging purposes of God that manifested in the first century church community. How about our day? What if God were to call you out of the prevailing religious system? What if he was to call him a people out of the prevailing religious system that identifies itself as Christian culture? What if he said to you, are you willing to come out? Are you willing to come all the way out if necessary, if need be, in order to find my purposes? And I say to you, we have scriptural precedence for such a call. Mm. Has that call come? I don't know that we're there yet, but I've taken the earplugs out of my ears listening for a sound. Amen. Amen. So in chapter one, we're focusing on the call. Who's with me? Mm -hmm. On the call of Jeremiah. See, the Lord asked me that one time. Are you willing to come out? Are you willing to come all the way out? <laughs> So far out that they don't even think you're a Christian, just as they said you're in the first century. These people are not, they, Ju Judaism told Rome, these people are not Jews. And when, see, Jews had an exemption. They didn't have to worship the emperor. 
if you didn't have that exemption, you died if you didn't worship them. And the Jews told Rome, hey, wait a minute, these people aren't us. And a sea of blood was shed because brother turned against brother over the issue of Christ. Think it couldn't happen in our day? Help us, God. And the Lord said, are you willing to come out? Are you willing to come all the way out? I was sitting in my my pastor's Bible study with my little pastoral sport coat on and my Bible and my Strong's coordinates getting ready for a Wednesday night devotional. <laughs> I said, yes, Lord, I believe I am. And I heard something that really put the fear of God in me. He says, we'll test that theory. Come on now. And I could tell you some stories about how that has certainly been tested in my life. Yeah. But we... We actually know more about Jeremiah personally than we do any of the other prophets. He was 20 years old when he began to minister. Called out by God. Uh, Verse 5 tells us, from his mother's womb. Now, is this unique to Jeremiah? Paul declares in Ephesians 1 that there's a predestined call upon every one of us before you were born. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Think about all the dirty nasty, wicked, vile, polluted things you've done in your life and God called you and God made up his mind about you before the foundation of the world and said you were holy and without blame. Mm. (laughs) I could just talk about that all day long. Having predestinated us according to the adoption. Now that is not adopting a baby that's not really yours. Adoption is what a... See, because we're born again of the incorruptible seed. So you're not adopted in that sense. I'm a child of the devil, but God's overlooking that, and he's adopted me into his family, mm-hmm. you know. Now, it's now you're born again, forensically, from a spiritual standpoint, of the incorruptible seed. Yes. And the adoption was what would happen when a Jewish father would take his 12-year-old son and take him out into the marketplace and stand behind him and put his hands on his shoulders and declare to everyone that father did business with, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. And everybody that did business with that papa knew from that point on, everything the son did would become as effective as if the father said it or did it. It's called the awios in the original language. That's the kind of adoption we're talking about. The adoption of children. Mm -hmm. By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted. (laughs) <laughs> See, he makes us accept, accepted, we make ourselves approved. Mm-hmm. Well, I could talk all day about acceptance and approval. <laughs> Jeremiah did not feel qualified for the task, but God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. You may feel completely unable to fulfill what God has put in front of you, and everyone around you may agree that you are not qualified. But that doesn't change the reality of the call of God because God doesn't call you to what you, to do what you're good at. You may feel that, in fact, you are not called. Oh, I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. Lie. Bald-faced lie. Down from the pit of hell. Because Revelations 1.5, Revelations 5.10, and 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a king and a priest. Kings are leaders. Kings have jurisdiction. Kings are those that are called to lead men, to be influencers, to be establishers. You are a leader. You have a call. Your calling is unquestionable, and it is your responsibility, according to 1 Peter 1.10, to discern that calling and make your calling and election sure. And Peter says, if you'll do those things, you'll never fall. And Peter knew something about falling. <laughs> Verse 11 through the end of the chapter. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem. 
and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utterly, I'm sorry, I will utter my judgments against them, touching, pardon me, my computer just jumped. Where was I? Hmm. To perform it out of the north. For lo, I will call the families, sorry, here we are, 16. Sorry, guys, my computer took a leap. <clears throat> and I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their hand, their own hands. Thou, therefore, gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, an iron pillar, a brazen walls, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the king of kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So in verse 11, we find the inaugural vision of Jeremiah. He sees a rod made out of a branch of an almond tree. Now in verse 12, the father explains that this vision means that he will hasten his word to perform it. Now what does an almond tree or an almond branch have to do with God's timing? Almond trees came into fruitfulness very early in the growing season. Therefore, the almond tree blossom or fruit used in throughout the Old Testament is a type and shadow always of God speaking to us about the quick work that he's going to do. He said, I'm going to do it early. I'm not going to do it late. Mm -hmm. From this, we conclude that God is not reticent to speak to us about timing. Now, today, modern day prophetic teaching discourages any reference to seeking the win of God, of what God is doing, because the very it's the very first thing. Now, here Jeremiah is a baby prophet and the very first thing God says to him, as a very young and inexperienced prophet, God talks to him about timing. Now, if he was attending some of the West Coast or East Coast prophetic schools, they'd say, no, excuse me, uh, you're not going to get a good grade for that. Uh, don't, don't be talking about timing. No, uh, what is it, mates, dates, geographical moves, or babies. Well, man, you just eliminated about 75% of the prophetic words that are in the Bible. <laughs> So, <laughs> God brings this up to Jeremiah. He's young. He's inexperienced. Modern teachers today and so-called authorities say that only the very most mature, wizened, seasoned, and experienced prophetic voices should attempt to discern such things. But to the law and to the testimony... Uh, if God's word says differently, then we may safely ignore the pontifications of the assembly of the uninformed, no matter how lofty their so-called degree might be in the opinions of men and the religious world. The second vision of Jeremiah is that of a seething pot. And in the picture he's given him, if you're not paying attention, it's about something blow, uh, boiling over. It's about a pot. You know, it's boiling. You ever have something boil over? I cook. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, boils over on the stove and you got a mess to clean up. Ask Lakeisha, but we're not giving details. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Never mind. No, don't tell it. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just love to have fun with Lakeisha right now. <laughs> so, suffice to say that it involved a fire extinguisher. <laughs> or it should Flower. have. It should have. <laughs> Carry on, dear. We love Lakeisha. He's better now, Lakeisha. <laughs> And it was good. It wound up being a great meal. We just mm. enjoyed it. We can now discern. Uh, see, uh, Jeremiah is seeing things. We can discern that there's a seer anointing on Jeremiah. We look to see, listen to hear, sense to feel yes. what God may be saying. And one of those modalities will be stronger than others in our lives. Jeremiah obviously has a seer anointing. These, of course, are not giftings only for those called to the office of the prophet because the first Corinthians says you may all prophesy, then every one of you might be a, one who sees, one who hears, one who senses. The seething pot is a picture of a boiling over of evil from the north. Speaking of the Babylonians who are going to boil over and come down. In other words, he's saying this nation is going to be like if somebody took a pot of boiling water and threw it in your face. Ouch. He says that's what's fixing to happen to this nation. 
He says they're going to break forth upon all the inhabitants of the southern kingdom. And in fact, verse 15, listen to what he goes on to say. He says, not only that, He's not just talking about back then. Listen to what he said in verse 15. He said, I will set all the nations of the earth at the siege gates of Jerusalem and around the walls and cities of Judah. This was true in Jeremiah's day, and it's been true for 2,700 years of history since then. Why does the city of Jerusalem and its surroundings suffer such international meddling wars and difficulties? Because God has caused the world and its history to pivot as on a hinge on this city that he has chosen as his capital upon the earth. Now, because God will use Jeremiah, verse 16, to utter judgments against the people touching their wickedness and the fact that they have forsaken him, God tells Jeremiah to gird up his loins, the loins of his mind, and not be dismayed at the faces or the spirits of the rebellious. Lest God would confound, he said, if you're, if you're dismayed, I'm going to confound you before them. Mm. He goes on to tell Jeremiah, see, that's why whenever you're confronted by those, of course, when you're in confrontation, it's all about threat. And when we get confronted, uh, for the most part, we get confronted by people, we're immediately in their face. Wait, wait a minute, are, I see a threat there. Don't threaten. Go ahead and do it now. As a matter of fact, if if you if that's all the dirt you've dug up, let me give you a couple of phone numbers of some people that hate us more than you do, because they dug a little bit deeper. And go ahead and act now. Don't wait. Go ahead. Do it. Do your dirt. Do it now. Why? Because God will take everything that man tries to do against you and turn it to a sevenfold blessing in your life. And I'm not at all concerned about what man, who's going to separate you from the love of God. Uh, Man, what he thinks is going to do, go ahead, do your best, baby. Don't let me cramp your style. Let's get it on. You know, again, Jeremiah, Jehovah throws down. (laughs) Excuse me, you don't know what my name means? God is trying to put some boldness into this man to know that God's going to look out for him. He says, Jeremiah, I've made you like a defense city. You're an iron pillar to speak boldly to kings, princes, and priests and against the people themselves. Because, why? Because of the choices they're making, the choices they have made, and the choices they're going to continue to make until the entire city, the temple, and the people are totally extinguished and taken into captivity. Now, though the people will fight against Jeremiah, the Father says they will not prevail against him for one reason, and one reason only, God's going to be with him. Now, what about your life? You may have very few that actually encourage and support your calling. You may find yourself in a spiritually dead and dry environment without any light or hope to be found in your midst. You may face opposition. You may struggle with the fear of man. God's promise is that if you will not waver, you know, people say, oh, I'm just so confused, Brother Walden. Ah, confounded. Have you allowed yourself to be intimidated? by those you're supposed to be confronting? You know, we think that if we're confused and confounded, like we're, like we're just a victim of something. What if it, we're not a victim? What if it's about disobedience? Because you're sitting in a dead-end situation in a difficult spot in front of a rebellious people and God's been telling you to do something about it and it's against the protocols of the house and it's about don't rock the boat, baby, and don't step out where angels fear to tread and we don't want to cause a problem. And then you wonder why you're confounded because God said, Jeremiah, I'll confound you. In other words, he's basically saying, Jeremiah, if you're worried about those people being your enemy, you better pay attention to me. I'm a whole lot bigger than they are because God says, He resisted the proud. And that word means he sets his forces in array against the proud. And so, oh, I'm a believer. Yes, but as a believer, just as I am, you are capable of pride. And when we act in pride, when we act in self-defense rather than obedience, there's, there's our consequences involved that are never God's choice for us. He said, I'll cause you to be like a defense city. I'll make you like a Sherman tank. When in, I love Patton. He said, when in doubt, attack. <laughs> Let me tell you something. As a young man, I didn't like that too much. Uh, I, but I got put in some desperate situations where I didn't have a choice. It was attack or die. And so I attacked. 
And I found out, in, it's kind of like Gideon. Gideon's cowering behind the wine press, and the angel shows up, Hail thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> and he just didn't have much of a choice. He had nowhere to go but forward. And then he found out some things about God. And I found out some things about God. So, boy, you sure are bold, Brother Walden. I'm not bold. I'm experienced. That's it. You, need to, <laughs> you ask my wife. My lack of boldness almost destroyed our relationship when we were dating. My lack of boldness almost resulted in us not becoming an item, becoming who we are. Amen. And I spent nine months in confoundment because I wouldn't do what God said do because of fear. But I found out some things. So I'm not bold. I'm not brash. I'm not presumptuous. I'm experienced. And I want to take that experience. I want to bundle it up. And I want to salt your life with the testimony of my experience because it's not the testimony about Russ Walden. It's the testimony about who God is and who Jesus is about your call. Uh, and my desire is that God will give you your version of where we've been walking for 10 years short of a really bad flu in Amsterdam, <laughs> New York. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so God says, if you will not waver or be dismayed at the mistreatment or misunderstanding you may experience at the hands of others, you will not be confounded. You will fulfill your call and see the deliverance of God over your life in the midst of your enemies. Don't you hate that? Surrounded. They, we got you surrounded. You, know, you got you surrounded looking for a ball bat. That's not how Jesus thinks. They got you surrounded. He's looking for a fork and a knife because he knows that there's a table. Provide. You know, oh, God, they're going to, I'm about to get mowed under here. And he looks at you and said, I'm hungry. Are you hungry? <laughs> there's a table. I gave some prophetic word today. Somebody's wanting to see into their future and know some things. And I, I saw them trying to figure some things out. And on the other side, I saw Jesus sitting at a picnic table eating a sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the midst of that, they were trying to figure some things out. And he said, have another sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have a picnic. See, that's the promise of God to Jeremiah. And God's promise to you, my brothers and sisters. And you know who you are. If you're listening, it's you. It's the promise of God that as you choose to make your calling and election sure, as Paul and as Peter said, they will make you that you will never fall. You will never fail. I hate failure. You hate failure? I hate failure. Sure. You can walk in this life in a place it's a fail-safe zone by responding to what God is doing and saying in your life. I know I've got a lot of dear friends that are living in intimidation because they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to rock the boat with their loved ones. They don't want to rock the boat with their kids. They don't want to rock the boat with their pastor. They don't want to rock the boat with the denomination they're a part of. They don't want to cause a problem with their congregation. And I'm here to tell you that if you'll not be afraid of their faces, Amen. God will make something happen for you that will give you a testimony like Jeremiah. Jeremiah went through some things, but he's got a testimony that reaches right down to us today and gives us substance and encouragement. So be bold. If you'll be bold, you'll be experienced. <laughs> See, boldness... Boldness is when you just, out of desperation, you just throw yourself into the fray, like Peter, Peter, vaulting over the rail against the advice of 11 of the most spiritual people of his life. And uh, it's that desperation to have but it, the will of God for your life. But if you'll be bold, in a very short order, it won't be a matter of being bold. It'll just be a matter of being experienced. You know how this works. And people will be pressing their nose against the glass if you're experiencing God and saying, wow, I wish I had a walk with God like that. And you realize it's got nothing to do with how powerful you are. It's just how experienced you become in what God does when you abandon your life to Him. So, Father, we thank you for Jeremiah. We thank you, and we uh, anticipate and say by faith we're going to extract every ounce of truth that will help us, that we can glean from the book of Jeremiah. We're going to come away at the end of Jeremiah saying, I never dreamed that I would get a revelation like that, 
regarding my life. So we thank you for the truth that we're going to dig out like a gold digger in California days. And we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your life. We bless our Morning Light family in Jesus' name. Amen.